Greetings, this is Hugh Ballou, and my special guest tonight is David Dunworth, and uh, my co-host is here also, Russell Dennis. Russell's been on this journey with me many times, and um, I appreciate your, your being here, Russ, and helping me, and, and uh, David, he, um, he will interject some questions along with me, and we've, we've posed the topic, topic tonight of profit is not a dirty word. Whoa. So before we get into that, I'm going to ask you to tell people a little bit of maybe three or four sentences about your background and why, why you should be talking about this topic, just so they get some context for who David Dunworth is. I, I know you and, and you got a lot of gifts to share. We're just doing a little snippet of those tonight. And as you and I have talked about, I encourage people to go away from the word nonprofit, even though we understand that to describe the sector. It puts us in this scarcity thinking mode that we can't make a profit. And so speak a little bit, and we, so I'm going more and more toward uh, social benefit, social profit enterprise, uh, charity, tax exempt charity. There may be ways to describe us by not saying what we're not. What, what are we? So David Dunworth, welcome to this interview, and say a little bit about your background, and especially on this topic of branding and profit. Great, yeah, sure, thank you. And uh, thanks, Russell, uh, glad to be here. Uh, my name is David Dunworth, and uh, like you said, I've uh, got a few things that I'm aware of uh, based on my history. I'm a vet of eight years. Uh, after the Vietnam War was over, they, I went to the public sector in the private club business in all the years until 1997, from 71 until 1997, I was in the private club business. I ran officers clubs and NCO clubs. When I got out, I stayed in the private club business. And during that time, I worked with on board of directors for the Amer uh, Michigan, Cancer Founda uh, Michigan Cancer Foundation, Leukemia Society of America, uh, the Fairly Mental Health Center, you know, a few others, Michigan Bach Festival, those types of things. So I, I'm not a foreigner to do what I like to call social enterprises, but yeah, charities. And you know, um, the bulk of my experience is marketing. And I work with some nonprofits. In fact, I work with one in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, and another one in Florida. And we talk about profit, and we have to talk about profit in the charity business because that's where sustainability comes from uh, you can't constantly be fundraising and burning it all up you've got to make enough revenue to build some reserves so that you have money to, that you can count on in those lean times and as you know it gets leaner and leaner and tougher and tougher as more and more uh, charities and uh, social enterprises come to to light, everybody's fighting for some similar dollars. And so marketing and the word profit have to go hand in hand. And um, you know, to give you an idea, up until, oh, I don't know, five or 10 years ago, most of the large national social enterprises uh, were relying on their quote unquote brand, their label, their logo to be their representative. And you know, a couple of the big ones, um, the uh, American Heart Association, a couple of others, uh, started building some directives and policies around their brand control and brand messaging. The real key to hold, in my opinion, the real key to the whole thing is that most of uh, today's charities don't really understand the word brand. And the brand is a whole lot more than just the logo or the picture or whatever it is that they believe they stand for. It looks like you want to interject something. Well, I do. I do. You just hit a really important topic here. And um, people can find this recording and these questions on nonprofitchat.org. Or later, we'll have this on our podcast, The Nonprofit Exchange, where we have about 12,000 people that have downloaded these episodes and are, are benefiting from um, smart people like you to help them 
install good business principles into the charities that they're responsible for. And so we're, we're posing a question. It's live on social media as we're recording this. And the first one is, what is brand and why is having a good brand important for a nonprofit? And I know I've worked with, with, with charities for 30 plus years. And a lot of them think just because we have a worthy cause, people want to give to us. So talk about brand and why is that important for, for a tax exempt organization? Well, sure. Uh, the word brand commonly referred to as a logo or your, you know, what's on your stationery and that sort of thing. But the, the true meaning of brand is an entity, whether it be an individual or a for-profit corporation or a charity, whatever, it's their entire belief system. It's what they stand for. It's what they represent to not only themselves, but to the community at large. And embracing the brand message and belief system, the philosophy is a, is both a valuable item externally for raising money. That's, but that's not the real importance of it. It's to spread your message, your belief system, so that people can engage and feel um, akin to an organization, so that they wishfully and want to support them on a routine, regular basis. It's developing that no like trust belief system that they can count on the charity to fulfill its social mission and they feel compelled to assist them, whether they volunteer or donate money or assist with in other ways. But the internal organization is as important as the external organization in belief in the brand, in the message, in their entire core belief system. That's what brand really is. And the importance of it is um, so that they have a unified message both in the house and out in the public so that there's no um, mistaking when somebody who works for XYZ charity is recognized in a restaurant one day and says, hey, don't you work for XYZ? I sure do, and boy, is it a great place. And, you know, they have that burned-in belief system. It's not canned. It's original. It comes from their heart. That's what an effective brand really is, and that's why it's important for a charity to spread their message and belief system to the community in as, as many engaging ways as they can to simply – expect people to donate to their cause, uh, it, it's, it's no longer a viable uh, management concept. Wow. <clears throat> you know, you've, you've been able to capsulize that in a way that, that's easily understood. I, um, two follow-up questions for what you said. I, I do get um, charities that say, oh, I don't want to do all that planning. It, it stifles my creativity or limits my creative juices. And I don't have time to do a brand. We'll just design a logo and that'll, that'll be it. So the first one is, you know, why, why, why should we invest in, you pointed out something really significant, internal belief and external. If you don't believe it internally, it's not going to show externally. So that's, that's really brilliant. So why should we invest the time and energy to define this culture and the second one, how is all this connected to this dirty word, profit? Well, the more uh, solid your belief system is internally and externally, the more contributions will flow to you without you having to pressure people, feel as though uh, you're asking when you shouldn't, those types of things. Historically, leaders of charities have kind of felt embarrassed or ashamed, not really ashamed, but uh, timid about asking for money in that uh, whether it was a lack of we don't deserve it or we waste too much of it or they're not giving enough so we have to do other goofy things to raise money, that sort of stuff. It's because they don't have it in their heart. It's a heart-centered belief system. That's what a brand really is. You know, and if you look like, if you look at a couple organizations like, oh, Habitat for Humanity for one, World Wildlife Fund for another. Those are two organizations that live and breathe their brand. 
you know just by hearing the names without seeing their logo, you know what the logos represent, you know what their names represent, is a total belief in what they do. Every single person on their in their organization that, and everyone that's tied to it believe in their heart and soul and DNA that what they're doing is the right thing to do. And they have enough supporters who believe the same way that they're very prosperous organizations. That's what a good brand does for a charity. That's um, how people perceive you. It's that's really, really well, well spoken. Now, um, do I remember that you have a book? Yeah, oh, I've, yeah, I've written several books. But um, recently I, I wrote a book on leadership. And um, in fact, anybody listening, if they go to my website, right on the home page, my website is marketingpartnersllc.com. Don't forget the S in marketing partners llc.com and right on their homepage they can find a copy of a digital copy of my latest book which just came out this week called leaders and their tribes and basically it's a, it's an ebook it's only about 35 36 pages long so it's a quick read but it talks about the the way that we have led throughout the course of our history and how leadership came from kings and those who would be kings, uh, you know, and then morphed into totalitarianism and then democracies and so on and so forth. And now, you know, we're moving into collaborative leadership. Uh, but 500, nearly 500 years ago, the North American natives had a belief system in that their chiefs were the leaders of their tribe, but it wasn't as though they had control over them. They were considered the guides, the change makers, the decision makers for what was best for the entire group. Uh, it was like, he would be like, the chief would be either a great grandfather or a great grandmother. There were some female Indian chiefs as well, but mainly men. And they had responsibilities of sensitivity, kindness, um, a strong, strong belief system. And that was imparted into their entire culture. It still is today. Um, so it, it talks about that and the evolution of, you know, what, what is going on in leadership today and what, what the future can probably look like. Well, so a copy of that. That's really good. It, we were talking earlier, my guest in a couple of weeks is going to be David Corbin, who wrote the book Illuminate. And um, you said you even refer. was this the book you referenced, David? Yeah, Illuminate is in there. Also, uh, uh, a couple other books. The, the, I put the uh, credits in the back. Yep. Love it, love it, love it. Um, we, um, we have a whole series of really profound people coming up, and uh, we've, we've had some amazing people. Um, and Russell and I take a turn at it every now and then to answer some of the top questions that we find that people are struggling with. And this one... Um, this topic is one that I'm not sure very many um, nonprofit leaders understand. I'm, I'm using the word nonprofit interchangeably, but because people understand it, it kind of is a bad habit. <laughs> so um, let's go. Um, Russ, do you want to weigh on this particular question before I go to the next question? Um, no, no, we'll go for it. You've taken some good notes, and we'll make sure we post them um, after the fact on uh, nonprofitchat.org. And they'll be in the notes for the the uh, the nonprofit exchange, which is our podcast, listened to by lots of unknown people. I wish I knew who they were. What happens? Here's question two, and it's going live as we're speaking, David, uh, on the internet. If people want to respond to it, use the hashtag nonprofit chat. It's a way to chat in the background about this. Uh -huh. we'll, we'll gather the responses. Uh, if you use that hashtag nonprofit chat, it'll surface in Twitter, especially. So the second question that just right. hit, hit the straight, what happens when our brand image or brand promise are abandoned? I guess we should start with defining what a brand image and a brand promise are. Well, sure. The brand image is the public's perception of what the individual or the organization is, what they represent. Uh, the brand promise is 
what their mission, vision, philosophical belief system is all rolled into one, and, has, and it's unified. When things go sideways, or there's a failure of some kind, crisis of conscience, or uh, let me give you a real life example. Um, everybody, I, hopefully, has, is aware of the Wounded Warrior Project. Very, very, very large uh, charity that helps our wounded veterans. Excellent, excellent organization, believed to be just tremendous. Well, they got a little black eye several months ago when it was unearthed that executive management were wasting money, spending things on lavish party and parties and entertaining and so forth, and they really took a beating. And I don't know if they've fully recovered yet or not, but that's what can happen when leadership fails to lead. And in their particular case, I believe it was the man at the top and a small cadre of people who kind of got a little full of themselves and thought that maybe they were entitled to things that the public didn't believe that they were. You know, another sometimes organization that gets some bad um, feelings is the Goodwill Industries. Uh, there was rumors floating around on the internet that they're a for-profit uh, company, uh, but they're really a 501c3. They bring in and support a huge international organization. They've taken in over $5 billion a year in total revenues, uh, and they supply jobs. They uh, su support uh, uh, just a tremendous population of people. But again, if the message isn't unified both internally and externally, ripples externally are going to create some bruised feelings, bad press, tarnished reputation, that sort of thing. So it behooves management, leadership, to really live their responsibilities. And that's oftentimes burnout uh, which is rampant in the uh, charity sector, uh, is from a variety of things, but in my own belief system, is not fully understanding or living the vision and the mission. Well, that's really good. That's really good. Um, part of, um, you're, I think you're aware, well, you've been through my one-day workshop. You've uh, yes attended in Vero Beach. Russ has been to two of them. He went to the one in Melbourne. Um, and um, so I teach pretty much my fundamental uh, strategic planning process for charities, which I call a solution map. And in 30 years, I've honed into what the essential elements are. And we can go too far and be too complex and nobody does anything because it's too bulky. Or we can do a, a lean strategy and there's not enough meat on the bone. But part of that process is defining the guiding principles. And I spoke a little bit about that in the workshop, but it occurs to me there's a, there's a, there's a connection here. Our guiding principles are how we make decisions. We have core values, but they're static. They're just single words, integrity, honesty, maybe a couple of words, but it's not really a statement that we can use for decision making. So I'm finding that, that um, some of these, these organizations that, that go over the edge, like you just described, are either are, don't have guiding principles or they're not following their guiding principles. And, and so a, a really good leadership uh, component is to make sure you have personal principles, how will you make decisions and how will um, your board make decisions. And it's closely related to this, this brand um, that you're talking about. Now, I, I got off track here. What's the difference in a brand promise and a brand image? I go back, keep in mind my age and mental condition. Keep, keep me on track here. Brand image and brand promise, we break either one, we're in trouble, right? Right. Brand image is the public's perception of you. It entails, you know, your physical presence, the, the logo, the, the, the publicity, the um, reputation, the print, media, everything that goes about how the, per the public perceives the brand. The promise is 
from internal to external. This is what we say we do. This is how we do it. This is our life. This is the way, um, if all things are perfect, the way you should expect us to be. So when going back to the Wounded Warrior Project, they broke that their brand promise by frivolous spending and that sort of thing. So they, they were disloyal to the to their public and the public at large, really. So rat they just didn't hurt their donors. They 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 hurt everything, both internally and externally. Well, it's a it's a um, it's it's an, a piece of integrity that we need to make sure that we uh, pay attention to. Our donors donate in good faith that we're going to use the money and be good stewards of that money, and sure. spending it not in accordance with the spirit of giving is a good way to cut off that revenue stream, isn't it? Right. Several, you know, you bring up the word integrity. Several years ago, there was a about an eighteen month study done with. Uh, um, Stanford University, Harvard, and the Rockefeller Foundation. I don't know if you're familiar with the study, and they came away with this principle called IDEA, integrity for the I, brand ethics, brand democracy, and brand affinity. And that's what they boiled down from talking to all of, I forget how many huge organizations and their leaders, and they came away with it. Those four principles as the foundation for a solid leadership um, mantra. So I is for what? Integrity. D. D. Democracy. Spreading the message. Uh Uh-huh. Ethics. Affinity. And affinity. I-D-E-A. Idea. Um, That's that's a really helpful, helpful... um, perspective to have so we're our brand promise how does that is that derived from our strategic excellence position or our unique value proposition we provide value to right. people and what makes us different is that is does your brand promise come out of that it comes out of it comes out of that uh your foundational core beliefs your statement of purpose um all of those things rolled into one. Uh, that's why branding is so misunderstood. It's not easy to explain because it's a whole, it's almost a, a belief system culture, like a cult, if you will. How a cult, everybody believes the same thing identically. They have, um, everybody marches towards the sea the same. And that's, that's what perfect leadership is. Um, where everybody goes voluntarily. Now, to say, is that healthy? In cults, not necessarily. But in finely tuned organizations, I could say it is. Well, you could use the military as a model. We have common purpose, which you talked about. We have a high-functioning culture, and we have the, the unanimity of our, our objective. We have a tactics, but we want to achieve this objective. Mm-hmm. And um, in... Um, I find a lot of charities want to do tactics without clearly defining their objective. Right. What you're pointing out is, is all of these components work together. They, they build the synergy of the whole and without one of these, I think we, we greatly compromise our ability to generate the revenue that we need. So let's go back to relate. I want to keep time back to the, the theme that we slapped on people at the beginning, uh, profit is a bad word. Why do you think it's considered to be a bad word or, or is it? It's certainly not a, it's not, it's a vital component to sustain organizations, regardless of what their tax status is. You have to have revenue generation and let's not call it profits. Okay. If, if profit is a dirty word in some people's mind, then let's talk about revenue generation. If you're a sound expense control corporation, nonprofit or profit, and you have great revenue generation, is there anything wrong with that? You don't have to spend all the money in the same year you get it. It's not, 
it's not the government allocation. It is trying to propel your mission forward with sustainability. And that's what the profit promise comes Well, there's from. lots, there's other definitions beside the money definition of profit. What, right. what does a man profit if he gives up his soul from the Bible? Mm -hmm. um, so there is, it's, it's David, it, I use this analogy often. It's like we build a car. And then we don't have any gas to go anywhere with it. Exactly. And the the profit, the, the cash flow is the in income, is is what is the gas, the fuel that runs our, our charity. Um, however, we need enough to make sure we get to our destination, and have enough to get back home again. And I think we're often too short sighted. And this whole this whole thing that you're helping me think through is how do we clearly define what we, how we define what we represent. So donors, grant makers, sponsors can understand the value of aligning with us to support us. And so I think we could have, for sponsors, they could think that there's negative brand awareness rather than positive brand value being connected with our brand. Well, speak of that a second. Sponsors want to give you money because it's good for their business. It's marketing money, really. Yeah, and they will do that. Um, part of it is altruism, but part of it, you're right, is to get their name out there, uh, get it related to uh, a worthy organization, and give back uh, is oftentimes a, a statement that's used. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. What does go wrong with that is when leadership of the organization fails in their brand promise because that will then not only tarnish their own brand, but it tarnishes those who are tied to it as well. So it's like that car that you're talking about. You, you finally get the fuel and you're going down the road and all of a sudden you discover that there's a hole in the tank. Mm -hmm. because whoever built the car didn't build it right. They didn't believe that it should have been built 100% according to its specifications. So they only did 99.5% of the work. Well, it doesn't take much for that car to run out of fuel, does it? Same thing goes with the brand promise. It doesn't take much to tarnish it. It sounds like we set this up, but we didn't. That was a pretty good... Pretty good. <laughs> Follow up anal analogy, and so Russ is taking really good notes here. I'll make sure that those get on the on the podcast notes and on the uh, nonprofitchat.com webpage. So let's. Um, this is this is real helpful, Russ. You just jump in if you have a question at any of these points. Would you please? Well, yeah, I was just thinking. You made a whole lot of uh, excellent points and. The brand really ties back into what I call the four steps to build a high performance nonprofit, which is from beginning to end to continue an operation because you had that solid foundation with all of the values and the action plans and understanding what you need. Uh, the second piece is creating the action plans to actually get it done. The third piece is staying on track and measuring everything that you do and making adjustments as you go along. And the fourth is communicating that value that you bring to all of the people that you serve. And <laughs> that, that comes, it, it, it's one word, brand. And when you're not there, you're not there. And so you have to be in this whole thing for the long haul, but you have to look at things incrementally and look at things, keep constant track. That's what happens. And uh, uh, thank you for your service, by the way, Dave, but oh, I'm a veteran my myself. Pleasure. And yeah, it was it was rough uh, running an officers club in England. <laughs> during well, yeah, where uh, were you at in England, by the way? I was at RAF Upper Hayford in Oxfordshire. When I've I been there many times. I was at Milden Hall and oh. South Rice. All right. <laughs> Square too. Yeah, and so yeah, but that whole the 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 uh, the wounded warrior was considered to be the the most elite of non pro of. Uh, Nonprofits that serve veterans, and it was a black eye to every nonprofit, just based on that perception. Yeah, if you can't trust wounded warriors, who can you trust? 
And so that had a major uh, uh, impact negatively for exactly. nonprofits. So, you know, when you damage your own brand, the repercussions really depending on the area you work in, you can drag a whole lot of people down with you if you're not careful. Right. So it is that important. We have talk, a couple toss one stone into the pond and what happens? The ripple effect affects the whole pond. Yay. So, yeah. We have a couple of uh, comments that have come in on Twitter. Um, the smart gypsy, Joyce Telag, um, has responded to our questions. Um, one way is to involve them. Uh, are their personal values congruent with the foundation's thrusts? And the other comment was, or immerse your board members in the cause by giving them opportunities to meet partners and beneficiaries. Any, um, any response to those? No, I think they're both valid points. Um, certainly, one of the things that I, I'm, I have no concrete evidence, I have only uh, my own belief, gut reaction, is that oftentimes, because of the pressures of the organization and trying to keep money coming in and that sort of things is that that brand statement, that brand mission, vision, um, belief system needs to be re-energized at least annually. And you know, that, that takes a facilitated effort for a, at least a day, maybe two days for all top leadership in an organization to get reacquainted with the uh, the actual beliefs and and analyze to to, to bounce off of, uh, Russell's comment a little bit is that fourth step has to be interjected with some analysis and evaluation uh, both internally and externally and that's one of the things that uh, as a as a consultant and marketer uh, facilitating those board retreats and those types of things are critical to getting the brand message consistent and refocused, re-energized, because every year certain board members change. Every uh, so often leadership falls out for whatever reasons, their burnout is uh, notable. And so it only makes business sense to, to re-energize, refocus, and do a 360 uh, evaluation plan evaluate revise recommit it's a, exactly it, it's a constant constant process so uh thank you uh, uh for responding and um let's go on to the the next question um how can leaders illuminate themselves to be more effective in leadership well, you know, some of this we've already discussed and covered, uh, facilitating, re-energizing, uh, refocusing. Uh, routine board meetings are not just about who's bringing what money in. It needs to be, you know, where can we do a better job and what is it going to take to um, expand our marketplace? Or, you know, those types of questions have to be routinely answered. However, there is a lot of, if you, if you uh, go on, on Amazon and look for nonprofit books or charity books, you're going to find that there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. But um, the one book that you mentioned, Illumination, is, it's an excellent read. And uh, Dr. Robert Boggs, who is the author of, uh, he's a Native American, PhD, who is author of a couple of books uh, about leadership in the Native American culture and how we're just now coming around to their way of believing it. Uh, it's a good thing we didn't eradicate them completely because there's some pretty smart people there. Uh, so illuminating themselves is, is to get in, uh, get positive energy infused into them in a, in a can-do attitude, uh, which oftentimes gets beat down because of the pressures of the day. But, you know, it's... One of the, when in a business that I worked uh, with many, many years ago, the man um, who said profit is not a dirty word also said that, uh, you know, every now and again, 
you got to get a shot of whiskey just to change your mood. Well, the analogy is probably not a very good one, but you know, something different has to occur in order to make things change. Uh, and some people say a change is as good as a rest. You know, to re-energize, to refocus, sometimes it's to step away. How can they re-energize themselves? They need to they need to ask their constituents internally and externally how they're doing and what can they do to improve. And I don't know if uh, all that many charities survey well enough or often enough. You know, that's a good point, David. I think we don't really think about installing good business principles in the charities we're responsible for leading, either as board members or as nonprofit uh, executive directors or as founders. Um, and, and so there's a, there's a continuum here that you're highlighting that there's, we're always walking in the path of integrity, and making decisions based on what we said we were going to do. And so we want, don't want to be a, a rules-based society. We want to be a principles-based society exactly. and realize there's, there's an impact for all leadership decisions, like you pointed out earlier, good and bad. There are consequences to our, our decisions. And so, um, Russ, about this, this, this leadership piece and making these kind of decisions, weigh in on that, would you? Well, you know, one of the things that, that would astound you is how few people that sit on the board actually know their constituents or the people that are actually getting those services from your nonprofit. Uh, and there's not enough conversations with the people who uh, directly be impacted. I think that's changed for the better, uh, but I, there's still a little bit of work to do on that regard. Uh, but leaders today uh, have to be a little bit more versatile and they have to build uh, leaders around them and not work to their weaknesses, but work to their strengths. And so that creates more opportunities for collaboration among people that are out there and uh, bringing people into the planning process to um, actually build what you're creating. And that involves you bringing donors to the table, servant leaders to the table, uh, direct program beneficiaries and staff. It's that constant conversation. And there's a difference between cult and culture. Uh, and, and culture, I mean, you can be excited about what you're doing uh, eat, sleep, and breathe it because it's what you believe in. It's at the core of what you do without being crazy or fanatical about it. So that's really important. When you're excited and the people around you are excited and you can keep that excitement level, that's a piece of what a leader does, serve as a, as a cheerleader. You tell your team what's possible and what they can do. Uh, you encourage them to go out and, and take chances, take some risks. Uh, you reward the, 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 in, um, the, what do you want to call it, initiative. You reward that initiative to actually go out and take a chance. You don't, you don't punish people for making a, a mistake. You, you use it as a learning opportunity. So it's about innovation, and that's what nonprofits do. Uh, the government will chip in a lot of money to solve the social problems, but the government on any level is essentially a bureaucracy. And when you have nonprofits, you got social entrepreneurs and people of purpose. They go in, they come up with innovative solutions, and hopefully they can come up with innovative solutions that once uh, they're off the ground, they can be scale. So you're starting to see a different uh, view of business in general. There's a lot of movement toward growth and doing the right thing. Uh, and, and the marriage of doing the right thing and generating healthy amounts of revenue is, is starting to look more and more the same, regardless of your tax status. It's happening a little bit more slowly than I'd like to see, but it's moving in that direction. And so hopefully uh, the focus will be on doing the right thing where you can still generate revenue. Uh, it's recommended that nonprofits have... Uh, Profits, which they call surplus in, in the nonprofit sector, exactly. recommended that they have six months reserves on hand. How many for profit businesses have that? Exactly. 
So it's it's good stewardship of the money, isn't it, Russ? That's absolutely. Um, David, you may not notice he slipped in a phrase. We're we're on a crusade to eliminate the word volunteer. He put the word servant leader in there. Servant leader. We're, there's lots of things that we dumb down on, and volunteer is a minimalist standard. We show up when we want to. We do what we choose to do instead of uh, appointing a person a leader of an initiative or a project or a committee. So people are leaders in, in, in the charities. And in the church especially, we say that people should volunteer. Well, that's contrary to our theology. You're, not, you're called into Christian service or to the synagogue. So we, we are members in ministry. We are servant leaders. We're community leaders in action. So there's lots of ways to reframe Part of what we're doing is helping charity leaders reframe their thinking into good, sound principles. And it's important to release the old paradigms uh, by letting us substitute a new word. Instead of having a meeting agenda, we have deliverables. Instead of having volunteers, we have servant leaders. Instead of having a nonprofit, we have a tax-exempt charity, social benefit organization. So I think releasing some of the what's bound us up it comes along with establishing a new definition of it. Well, it also expands the thinking, you know, at every level, once that message is broadcast internally and externally. That's great. You know, a couple of organizations that when Russell was talking came to mind is, uh, you know, Habitat for Humanity. If you look at President Carter's uh, organization, it, it, how old is he? 94, 95 years old, and he's still growing a tremendous organization um, that, you know, is, is firmly entrenched in trust. And people come from everywhere to help support that organization. Why? Because their, their integrity, their message is spread dem democratically, they have high ethics, and therefore draw a lot of affinity. So, you know, it, it's a great model. And a, a very misunderstood organization, at least on my level, is the Salvation Army, which, you know, um, I spent some time researching them uh, a couple of years ago. And the leader of the Salvation Army, his total compensation pack benefits medical, dental. He lives in it. He gets to live in a house is roughly $60,000 annual total compensation as opposed to several million dollars in some of the other large non uh, organizations so you know there's some definite inequities that uh, don't necessarily need to be there well that's part of their belief system and uh, they're there to serve and and I'm familiar with the Salvation Army um, and like I am with um, Habitat they um, they model integrity in what they do, and you really can't fault them because they're they're really transparent with everything they do, and they exactly. really represent quality and and service to humankind above above anything. And they're in businesses that the government shouldn't be in. You know, the government governs that the work of the charities is so important to our communities. And so my mission is to help empower all of these charities to be able to fully achieve their mission. And it, it does mean driving, whatever you call it, but at the bottom line, excess capital. We have an endowment fund that's gonna help us create a legacy and a perpetuity, but we also have leftover capital, which is profit, which is used to fund other initiatives. And really having the adequate funding means we're not spinning off energy, nickeling and diming, doing the, the cake sales and the raising the next level of funding so we can make payroll. We're, we're able to focus on the initiatives that matter. Sure. So being and responsible. That goes, right, that goes all the way back to your comment early on is that oftentimes leaders say, you know, I don't have time to plan. I'm too busy putting out fires. Well. Think about you have time enough to do it over again when it fails because you didn't do it right the first time. So why don't you have the time to do that? <laughs> yeah. And you pissed everybody else off in the, in the meantime and wasted yeah. money. Well, you know, it's a lot of counterintuitive action or inaction uh, oftentimes is their worst enemy. I, I, I wish some of those times so if, I knew, so if I knew they were coming, I would record it and make them <laughs> listen, listen to it. Yeah. 
do you hear how stupid this sounds? Um, but you're right. We hear that um, way too often, way too often. So we're on the, the down, down leg of this interview. We just got a, a few minutes on the, to the top of the hour. And so let's, let's look at, we've talked about this throughout. It's the, uh, the process of living out the brand, who we are, how we represent the brand internally, externally. So what are, what are some ways that we can equip ourselves to think about it, to be it, and to live it out on a continuing basis? Well, it all starts with hiring right uh, and leadership and servant leaders who come on board. Uh, you know, there, there's, there has to be some vetting uh, to a degree. You know, not everybody is uh, um, cut out for, you know, that type of service. And so in my opinion, you know, in order to, in order to move forward, you have to know where you're at, where you came from and a solid plan of where you want to go. Um, how can they live it by, by getting in tune internally with their core belief system, exercising their brand promise once they've clearly defined it and monitor it so that we stay on track. Uh, all the uh, activity without analysis um, may get you down the road, but what, where are you headed? And how fast did you get there? Did you get there in time? Uh, what did it cost to get there your, back to your car? How much gas is in the tank? And is everything functioning properly? You know, you get to take it in for service every now and again. So I think the, you know, different ways of looking at their mission uh, and trying to break it down into pieces to see what works, what needs tweaking, where do we need help? And oftentimes they're afraid to ask for help because oftentimes help costs money and money is always an issue. There's a differentiating factor here. Um, we think it costs money, but it really might be an investment. Exactly. That's how they need to look at it. Well, you just talked about hiring. So talk about the hiring a minute. We want to get the right servant leaders. We want to get the right staff. But we also want to hire people that can give us the good advice that you're talking about. How do you sort out? Because there's lots of uh, snake oil out there. How do you sort out which person's promise is the one that you should believe? Well, it takes, like I said, some vetting in order to do. Who are you, who are you looking at working with? Who are you dealing with? You know, in, in one of the organizations that I'm involved with, um, there is a significant vetting process that is handled by a, a third-party organization that does a, a, a global background check on, on everybody who's involved in the organization. It's called uh, the Clear Business Directory. And um, that's one excellent way to ensure that the person that they're looking at working with or hiring uh, is actually who they say they are and can do what they say they can do. And that comes from a, a, a third party who has done a thorough examination of the person's past. That's my recommendation. Well, and, and I interviewed Justin from my other podcast, uh, the Hugh Ballou podcast, the uh, Orchestrating Success. Um, and it's, I need to get him on this series because a lot of charities think they don't need to do that. It's somehow impolite to ask people about their background. But I live in this town of 30,000 people. And several years ago, with two or three charities, there was like $750,000 that went missing amongst those charities. And we could, they could point fingers at the person who was responsible. And had they done a background check, they could have discovered this person had a history of, of this sort of thing. Sure. So it's, it's, it's almost irresponsible leadership and not doing that background check. That's Justin Reckla and Justin and Tanya have the clear business directory, Exactly. but they used to be army intelligence officers and they, they know how to dig up stuff. Yep. And I, uh, I've gone through the process. I believe you have, mm -hmm. um, several other people that I work with and collaborate with have all gone through, the vetting process to make sure that the organizations that we we tie ourselves to know that they can know, like, and trust us based on what we say, what we do, and what we have done in the past. 
things. So, you know, I, it behooves every servant or social enterprise uh, organization to go through a vetting process for their key people. Well, and I think you can do your own vetting by looking at uh, social media. You can also check out if they said they had an MBA from Harvard, do they really have the diploma? Or did they just say that they did that? Did they actually go to a couple of classes and that was it? And they've listed um, projects they've worked on in the past. Well, are those 10 years ago? What have they done in the last six to 12 months? And can you talk to those people? And I, I think we don't, we, we look at somebody and we say, oh, what the heck, they look like a nice person. And this person is the representation of your brand. Mm -hmm. And so the, your brand extension is everybody who, who says they work for XYZ charity. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, that's a big mountain to, to, to step up with. So we're, we're on the summary part. And as we exit here, I want you to think about some parting wisdom, a tip or some, some thoughts you'd like to leave people with. But Russ, on these, these last two, illuminating and living out our brand. You've worked for charities for a number of years and you've worked externally with charities. What, what comes to mind when we're talking about these last two areas? Well, you know, the, the first thing when we talk about illuminating and I love David's book, uh, we're talking about looking at where the bodies are buried. You know, sometimes there's some things that aren't uh, necessarily very flattering. But if we don't admit to ourselves what's happening, we can't fix them. So this is a very important thing. Uh, this is, uh, and we had, we had, I, I worked, as you know, uh, for 10 and a half years for the Roostic Band of Micmacs, a federally recognized tribe. So there were some things that were community involved and, and family oriented. And, you know, sometimes people said some things that, weren't necessarily gentle or PC, but the needs uh, as far as far as the community were concerned were put first. So illuminating is is looking at all of that. You have to be certain of uh, what's going on and keep an eye on that. That's very important. And uh, to the second point, which I forgot because I got so wrapped up in, in illuminating. Uh, you have to be all in. You have to be all in for the long term, and uh, that's critical. So it, you know, when 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 David talks about brand, uh, it's not a logo. This is this is the whole enchilada. This is everything that you stand for, and you have to be ready to, uh, if necessary, to blow that up. Because I think the best time to make uh, changes is is when you are on top of your game. Yeah. And most people wait until the bottom's dropping out and they're in the panic to start making changes. And that's when they can be uh, least effective and the most negatively impactful. So uh, it's that continuous improvement, uh, the, the, the just-in-time learning that we got from, <laughs> and, uh, and that elimination, but it's always being thoroughly honest about where you are, no matter what that looks like. And, and then moving from that place. Well, good, good words. Um, David, it's really obvious that you're very skilled. Um, you're very skilled at uh, your craft. Um, Thank you. I'm looking for some other people have, have tweeted what we're doing out there. Underdogs. Thank you. Um, Twubs. We're on Twubs watching the, uh, the, the chats go by. Um, so as you're drawing this to a close, what parting thoughts do you have for, for people listening to the podcast or listening live? Well, I think educating themselves more thoroughly about what it really means to embrace their brand um, and wrap their arms around the, the organization's belief systems, both internally and externally, and share the message that is the right message and the true, as Russell said, the true message. What's really happening now? If we're uh, in a retrenched situation, then you, I think you should admit it. Uh, secondly, I think they should educate themselves more, more so on uh, 
what I'll call facilitated learning, um, follow on education, um, board retreat with the right talent in front of them to help them with their uh, questions and shortcomings and ideation. Um, I'd also like to encourage them to come to my website and pick up a book. Uh, it's uh, just went on Amazon. It's only in paperback on Amazon, but the digital copy, I can uh, pick up one there right on my homepage, marketingpartnersllc.com. And I think it's in the chat box. Yeah, it'll be on the, it'll be on the um, oh, podcast welcome. notes. I've really enjoyed the, the discussion, and uh, it's been quite illuminating for me as well. So thank you. Well, thank you for sharing your wisdom, and um, thank you for being part of this series of thought leaders sharing good principles for those of us who lead charities. David Dunworth, uh, it's been good uh, hearing from you. It's been good having this, this dialogue about things that matter. And Russ, you're always valuable as a partner in this process. So thank you both for being a part of this discussion. Thank you. Have a great evening.